So thank you for taking the time to speak with me today, Robert. Thank you for having me. So tell us a little bit about Spike. Yeah, well, Spike, uh, the Spike of the title is Spike Milligan, played by me. Um, and it's a new play written by Ian Hislop and Nick Newman, all about um, Spike Milligan and the goons, particularly focusing on yeah, the time around about when the goons were just starting to become popular um, in the 1950s, the play set in the kind of mid 50s. And um, yeah, for those who don't know who Spike Milligan is, he is a hugely influential uh, comedian, writer, poet, performer, who, uh, who yeah, kind of burst onto the scene in the early 1950s with this anarchic radio comedy show called The Goons, which was quite unlike anything that came before it. And uh, it was hugely popular, hugely influential. So this play is a kind of exploring the development of that time and a celebration of his of his work, really. And how surreal does the play itself get? Because the goons kind of toyed with that type of, of comedy, right? They did. The goons were, that's what was so wonderful about the goons. They were absolutely mad and these weird kind of, they took these huge kind of surreal, logical leaps. We're not too surreal. We, we're, we're trying to tell the real story of his life, but we do... We do have um, some fun, surreal moments in the kind of playing of it. And um, Spike breaks the fourth wall and talks to the audience quite a lot. And um, the, the staging is all kind of quite fast and fluid. And yeah, funny, strange things happen. And we kind of mix scenes together and um, and, and, and we do things like that. So yeah, there is, there is a nice surreal, surreal kind of thread working through the show. Oh, interesting. How do you manage to to bring that into the creative process in a way? Is it quite regimented, the comedy? Do you keep it quite loose? How do you all sort of collaborate on that? Yeah, we've, um, we've, we, we've kept it, we keep it fairly loose, um, but we don't, we do stick to the script. We, 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 mm. we do occasionally, if we have stuff where we're interacting with the audience a bit, we, we do have room to go off a little bit, but we do tend to stick to the script. It's a great script, but um, yeah, and, and, yeah, the play is very fast and snappy. So I think in the courage, but that was the, that was the thing we were trying to capture the most because the goons have this huge energy to them. If you listen to them now, they're all on. Most of them are on BBC Sounds now to listen to. They're they're just fast, snappy. They don't let up with the jokes. So we've tried to capture that kind of energy in the play. Um, if you don't like one joke, there's always another one along <laughs> in in a minute. And um, I think what Ian and Nick wanted particularly to capture was there's a lot of when we when we see kind of things on TV that that talk about comedians' life, uh, it's often quite dark. It's often like the tears of a clown kind of thing. And Spike did have that side to him. He did have uh, he had uh, got shell shocked in World War Two and had um, quite serious uh, mental health issues throughout his life, which he was always quite honest to talk talking about. So we do deal with those, but we don't dwell on them. It, it is. The, the tone of the show is kind of joyful and silly and and, and happy. And uh, cause I think that's what people need at the moment. Absolutely. So was that a kind of key aspect of, I guess, your work on the show, bringing life to his character and also Ian Hislop and Nick Newman writing it, was to make sure that you have, I guess, a picture of the whole man. You know, yes. he's got his sort of public facing side with the, the sort of gooms and he's got his sort of inner battles, but bringing that yeah. tonally together, I guess. Yes, yeah, yeah. That, that's that's been that's been the big challenge finding finding when Spike is kind of on, if you wish, which he kind of always was. He was always telling, he was always funny and always telling jokes. He just couldn't help it when you read about it. But um, he could also be quite difficult to work with, quite uh, argumentative, quite and 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 worked worked himself, yeah, to the point of breakdown when he was writing because. Mm -hmm. He used to write an episode a week and it'd be like 30 episodes in a series and he was pretty much doing it on his own. He did have co-writers, but but he, the bulk of it would be him and it was his passion project. So he would just work and work and work. Um, and, we, and, we, and yes, and we showed the effects that that had on his marriage. But yeah, well, for me as a performer, it was trying to find how you, yeah, just, just, just finding the moments of being real, really, you know, as opposed to, as opposed to the jokes, and there are a lot of jokes, a lot of Spike's jokes. You know, Ian and Nick will freely say they, uh, they, when they ask why do they want to write this, write this show, they, they, they'll always say, oh, half of it was written already. We've got all the best jokes already." <laughs> so um, we do use a lot, and we do um, also act out part of Goon shows as well. 
uh, with, with the microphones as if we're recording them. So um, there's a lot of original Spike material in there. But yes, it was just finding the, the pattern through to, um, to, to to finding a real person in amongst all the jokes and the, mm -hmm. and the, and the, and the tomfoolery. How do you even begin to approach playing someone who not only is you know is a real person is is not only so eccentric but he's so unique and so beloved? Where, yeah. Where's your way into that, Robert? Yeah, I mean, when I was offered it, I just thought this is great. What a great part! And then I started to get slightly worried because <laughs> kind of like, he's one of the funniest people has ever you know who's ever been. Yeah. So uh, no pressure. So I tried not to let that worry me too much. Uh, I, I, it helped that I was a fan and I knew his work. And my dad, uh, who's sadly no longer with us, was was a big fan. Like a lot of his generation, he grew up listening to it first time around. Um, so I, I felt I felt like I knew the style of the comedy, and then I watched. Um, I, re I read a lot about him and I watched uh, as much as I could archive footage. I knew his performing style, but I wanted to try and find footage of him as a real, you know, sort of real interviews from the time. Um, and he's, he's quite young when he's doing this. I think a lot of people have an image of Spike as this kind of slightly grumpy old man figure, mm -hmm. but he was young and just full of energy. So it was just trying to capture the energy, capture his essence, but without, without trying to do a pitch perfect impression, because I think that would possibly mm -hmm. drive me mad and maybe drive the audience mad as well, if you had an exacting every vowel sound, everything mm -hmm. exactly. So I think it is just to capture more, it's our version of Spike. It's not, this is Spike as he was. This is this is the story we're telling of our version of Spike. So I try, I tried to get into it. And it was, in terms of research, it was, you know, really good fun. Just watching loads of silly videos of Spike. Um, um, so it was, a, it was a joy to, to research actually. And it's been a joy to do and get it in front of people and hear people laughing, which has been really nice. Oh, bro. And I, I, I guess if you're, um, you know, sort of portraying a character who he sort of rose to fame as a writer, as a performer, but with a, a group, kind of mm. a comedy troupe, how, how do you interact with, with the other cast members who are playing the other goons? How does that work in practice? I know you're recreating certain scenes from the show. How do you, yeah. how do you get that kind of camaraderie across? Well, luckily, um... Uh, everyone in the everyone in the company is really is really lovely and, and funny naturally funny themselves so it hasn't been that much of a challenge to present to to look like we're having fun with it and like we're and like we work together yeah. I, but it, it, yeah we it, it is just just going through it and getting the speed of it and the timing uh so it feels like it's just flowing so we have some scenes where they are just messing about in the pub because that's how it started you know that's how a lot of great comedy starts people good friends messing around together in the pub. So, um, and uh, yeah, Jeremy, who plays Harry Seacombe is, is fantastic. Paddy, Paddy Windsor, who plays, um, um, uh, Paddy Warner, sorry, not Paddy Windsor, Pad, Paddy, Patrick Warner, who plays um, uh, Peter Sellers is fantastic too. So it's not been hard. We just kind of, yeah, you just keep, keep, throw, keep throwing things around and see what works. And, and, and we're still, we still, try and play around with it on stage now we never try and do it exactly the same every night we always try and tweak it a little bit and try and make the other person kind of catch them off a little bit and try and say something a bit differently and and, and it's, it's about yeah the enjoyment of trying to make the other people laugh as well I think that's that, that's what's right mm -hmm. yeah is that one of the joys of touring this kind of show is that you can get you can not only kind of play with different interpretations every night you know on the stage but also yeah I guess different audiences react differently to different yeah. scenes and yeah, no, they do. They do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's that. That is the fun in every every theatre presents a new challenge of a different space and a different size, and you've got to figure out what, what you know where where all the props are going to go, where the, where the wings are all different, and then and then each theatre is a different size, and and especially when you're playing out to the audience, you, yeah, you have you have a different experience depending where you are, and um, yeah, and some audiences we've definitely noticed that different towns have different feelings to them, and um, I'm sure Cardiff's going to be the best though. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> I think Cardiff will be the best. If only because all my friends and family are coming. <laughs> oh, amazing. <laughs> so they better be it's good. A real family affair. Yeah, because I'm from Paul's oh, Call, wow. so I'm only, I grew up only half an hour down the road oh, from Cardiff. Wow. Oh, gosh, have you ever so, yeah. been in Cardiff before? I'm assuming yes, but who knows? No, no, I actually, oh, really? I don't think since I was, um, 
in the National Youth Theatre, I appeared on stage in Cardiff. I've done I've done TV and radio in Cardiff, but I've never I've never done a play in Cardiff. So um, so um, yeah, I'm really really looking forward to it. I'm and we're there. Yeah. When are we there? I should say the date, shouldn't I? It's the last week of November. We finished on the 26th. So I think it's 20, 20, 20th to the 26th of November. We're there. We're in, in Cardiff or 21st. I should have known that. I should have that written Just, down. <laughs> Not very well it. prepared. You got it. Last week of yeah. November. Come last on, week of November. Last full week of November. Come yeah. and see us. Oh, amazing. Yeah. And it, just on the cusp before Christmas. So everyone's in very jolly spirits. Yeah. And... yeah, yeah. Come and do your Christmas shopping down Queen Street and then <laughs> pop in and watch, watch us at the new theatre. It's a great day out. Absolutely. And it's so nostalgic, yeah. I guess. I think a lot of people, you know, whatever age you are, you have some maybe, I mean, even if you're not, uh, you sort of didn't grow up with the goons, you would have grown up with Monty Python, who were really heavily influenced. And then that's trickled down to sort of uh, mischief theatre and the horrible yeah. mischief team. There's yeah. kind of hints and, and influences going, going all the way through to today. Yeah, it's really quite, we acknowledge that at the end of the play, actually, uh, just how many people have been influenced by him. It is quite astonishing, this um, this generation who then went on. To, so, yes, despite the goon started in 1950. So you had people like John Lennon listening to it, Paul McCartney, um, when they were when they were children. Uh, all of the Pythons acknowledge it, is it, it. You know, I don't think you would have Monty Python, that Peter Cook, Dudley Moore, all these people. He, he got in first and a lot of... Uh, uh, a lot of kind of jokes or routines, which you think maybe later you can hear the beginnings of them in the goons, even the classic um, uh, "Don't Tell Him Pike." He does a version of that <laughs> on the goons, you know, twenty years before Dad's Army. So all these people were listening, sat by the radio, and what was good was it felt new. It was like rock and roll almost mm. for a certain generation who got that because the parents didn't understand it. The parents just like, "What is this? What is this nonsense?" <laughs> all these silly voices, and yeah. none of it makes sense. And the kids would be rolling around on the floor laughing, and so that those kids then took that with them, and when they went, made their own version of it, and then passed that on, and then Monty Python influenced Vic and Bob, and you know, and it goes on and on and on. So it's that's why, and I think yeah, Ian and Nick thought Spike may have been forgotten. I've had to explain who he is to quite a lot of people. Some people my age you go, oh yeah, I've heard of him, but who is he, or what, or what, why, why do I know that name? And then you have, to, if you don't know too much about comedy, then you have to mm. say, well, yeah. Everything stems from that almost. That's shocking, Robert. I, it, it's strange to think how how like a ubiquitous presence he has in comedy, you know, just in sort of writing even yeah, today. Yeah. And yet people just he's sort of kind of a little bit behind the scenes, even for someone so eccentric. Is that one of the things yeah. that he wants to sort of reveal? Like, you know, here's the real, here's the guy. Go yeah, and check yeah, him absolutely. out. Look, look yeah. what he's influenced. Yeah. And it's also that amazing time, I think. Um, the the because they because they all all the goons were in the were in the in the army, so they would then go entertaining the troops during the time during the fighting. So so I think they were all this generation kind of the Second World War helped to create this whole generation of of, of actors and writers and performers that um because they were all working class kids as well you know three working class lads kind of making their own comedy and putting it on the radio and that. And that's that feels quite rare these, these days in the world of comedy. Yeah, I can't think of many kind of like you know three proper working class lads kind of with their own sketch show on the on the radio now would seem quite rare. So um, so it was it was a really kind of yeah interesting and important time. Yeah, and it is just to get to 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 celebrate that fact really, and um because he died. I mean Spike died twenty years ago, so he hasn't been around for quite a long time. There's a whole generation who've grown up not really knowing they may have done his poems at school or or they may have they may have heard a bit about him but i don't think they actually know the work mm -hmm. so we have had we have had younger it's not just it's not just silver hair when i look out into the audience we have we have had some young people coming in some young comedy fans um yeah. who are coming in and some people who are yeah who've been brought by their parents going oh you must come and they don't really know anything about it but they they, they really they really enjoy it and get to know it it's Amazing. a good night out for anyone whether you know the goons or not i, I think Fabulous. I think people who are, you know, really wanting to be cheered up at the moment will, even if they if they know Spike, if they don't, you know, it's a perfect kind of introducer, you know, introduction for them. Yeah. But also just a great night out, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Moment. Yeah. Yeah. And why is theatre really suited for this story? Do you think? Well, I just think um, 
you get the instant reaction you get you get mm. the laughter um it could absolutely work as a tv project i think the seeds of it may have been sown as a tv project when i think it was um spike's centenary i think i think you and nick originally started writing it as a tv script and it didn't quite didn't quite happen so yeah. they thought they took it out as a play but i think because uh there's been no theater for such a long time mm. and and it's that communal feeling and you can feel it as the shows go on you know it takes little people time to warm up and then they get into it and then by the end they're laughing and cheering and and clapping and it's just that yeah it's, it's that space it's being in a space with other people all enjoying the same thing and all laughing together I don't think anything is quite like that so I think I think that's why it works best on stage Wonderful. And what's your favourite moment that's happened so far, either rehearsing or uh, when you've performed it to an audience? Is there something that stands out for you? Uh, we had uh, we, 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 we had a couple of drunk ladies in the front row the other week. I don't know if that would be my favourite moment, but it's something that stands out. That's the joy of live performance. They, yeah. were, they, they were drunk and enjoying it, so at least they were, they oh, right. were happy. <laughs> they were the They hadn't had enough. <laughs> But um, but yeah, they were they were they were basically joining in. <laughs> so that's that's the joy of theatre. You have to deal with that. We had a strange moment in in Brighton where it turned out some kids had broken into the theatre and were running around the um the, the the royal boxes trying not to get caught by the front of house staff. Uh, so that that's all part of the joy of it. You you never quite know what's going to happen or what each audience is 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 going to be. But um. Mm. It's just, what what what's been lovely is just when we've had a nice full crowd, everyone's in everyone's in it and everyone is just is just laughing and then and um, I think that's that's possibly the yeah the the best moment for me is just mm -hmm. having an audience being happy and entertained. Who makes you laugh like that? Do you have sort of comedy uh, growing up or yeah? Well, no, well it would a bit of spike. I think for me my favorite is is um uh Vic and Bob um oh. they, they, they were my kind of heroes that I grew up with Vic and Bob and people like Chris Morris and Steve Coogan were my oh. kind of comedy touchstones growing up particularly Chris Morris in the day-to-day -day and, and Brass Eye I don't think I've ever laughed as much at anything as I have at, at, at uh as, as the day-to-day -day. and um but, but Vic and Bob consistently over the years they just have that kind of place in my heart where I just like if they're on I'll watch it and yeah I think yeah they, they're just they're, they're my comedy heroes really just pure right. pure silliness pure nonsense I'm quite surreal as well a bit, a bit yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I just um Chris Morris yeah I, I I just say PJ you've lost the news unprompted <laughs> <laughs> but actually I don't need context these days but it's just, yeah, it's just lines yeah. that sort of come to you, like spike, like spike jokes. Do you have a favorite yeah. spike joke? Is there one that kind of like you find yourself saying out of context? And... Um, oh, you've got me now. What, what, what do I? I've, we've, got, we've got some great lines in the show. Um, I like, I like his little poems are always good and always make me laugh. Uh, he has one that goes, There was a young man called Wyatt whose voice was incredibly quiet. And then one day it faded away. <laughs> that's that's one I, I always quite like. Um, Please tell me that's in the show, Robert. Uh, no, it's not. It's not in the show. Oh, no, no I, it's, it's all, the, no. it's all this. When, when I listen to the goons, it's all the strange you, experimental moments that really make me laugh the most. He has one scene where someone I go they go they, he, they're being sent because they're always spoofing like spy things and things like that mm -hmm. he's being sent to the secret rendezvous and he says you've got to knock the door and he says, is there a code yes knock six thousand times goes, <laughs> right okay and it, and, it, and it goes on for ages not and the knocks get faster and faster and faster and faster and faster, 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 faster. And then the door opens and he goes is this the tea house of the orchard moon he goes no next door and he goes, he goes next door <laughs> and then and then does it again and it goes on and on and on and on and and what 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 the show deals with is how much Spike had to fight the BBC to get stuff like that on, because mm. the BBC the the big wigs at the BBC they were just like the officer class from the war who didn't understand they were the parents who were just like well, what what is all this nonsense? So the, the the core of the play is is Spike's kind of battle with the BBC to try and get get the show how he wanted it. 
get the special effects how he wanted it. I mean, he ended up uh, um, transforming BBC sound effects. So he would always, you know, he'd ask for the most ridiculous things like Big Ben falling off Beachy Head or, uh, or you know, a Wurlitzer organ traveling through the desert as fast as it could go. And, and every, you know, so it was constantly pushing and challenging. And I think out of that came the Radiophonic Workshop and all the amazing things they did with like Doctor Who and, and things like mm -hmm. that. So, yeah, it's not just an influence on comedy, it kind of influenced radio as well. And what do you think, um, what do you think is the secret of, of comedy? Is it that kind of boundary breaking, um, sort of uh, rebelling against authority aspect that Spike embodied so well? Yeah, I think it is that. It's it's the, um, it's, 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 saying saying the least expected thing or the or or breaking the boundaries or just having a way of looking at the world that points out i think that's particularly what spike did spike would find the surreal or the silly in anything mm. any kind of phrase or or turn of phrase or anything he would make a little pun or a joke out of it so i think it is having a way that looks at the world that just takes the world and turns it a bit kind of sideways i think so I don't think it needs, yeah, I don't think it necessarily has to be, you know, taboo busting, although there is that, there is a place for that in comedy. But yeah, I just think it's turning things on its head, I think. And and, and saying, yeah, saying that just taking, tw taking the unexpected and just, and just twitch, turning it slightly, yeah. And bringing in that perspective that is so you, and that you, you know, you yeah. have that completely unique lens and the way you see things and being able to, to to find that in other people or to have that yeah. kind of um that ripple effect of laughter or everyone just gets that little adjustment yeah, it's, that yeah, must yeah, just yeah, be yeah. pure magic when that when that happens yeah and 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 sticking to it because you know spike it wasn't mm -hmm. like he was an overnight success he he spent years out on the comedy circuit kind of you know just people going what what is this clip doing just like just like all the but all the best kind of artists do and then everyone slowly comes around to their way of thinking i think so um, yeah, I think I think the world came to Spike as opposed to if you say if you if you know what I mean you know it, it, he didn't emerge fully formed, um, although he was a complete one off. I think and he was always funny, or, or even when he was in the army. I think you know he was his war memoirs are, are a really good read because they're just very very silly. But yeah, it is it is it's just it's yeah, it's it's making the world look at you come to your point of view. I think. And right to the end, you know, even you know, on his uh, on his grave, <laughs> I told yeah, you I was yeah. ill. I told you I was ill. It's not and, many um, people, you know, like their grave it can make you, you know, they they make make you laugh right so long after they, you know, no longer with us. But... And there's not many people who could have got away with saying what he did to Prince Charles. Do you know that anecdote <laughs> at the Comedy Awards? I won't say it because I'm not sure what what uh, we've got a family audience watch. Uh, but um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Again, it's just saying the unexpected. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, what do you want uh, audiences to come out of, of this play, of this theatrical comedy experience? What do you want them to, to, to feel when they come out or do? Do you want them to look into to Spike? Do you want them to be saying the jokes back to each other? What, what do you want them to, to do? Yeah, I think, I, I think, I think if we, if we send people out, out there to explore his work who maybe wouldn't have before, um, mm -hmm. and to maybe even go back to the goons, because I think a lot of people don't really know the goons as such maybe they know spike through various other things but but haven't actually listened to the goons i think if you go back and listen to them and i think that's great and i just i think if we just we just want to send people out happy really and i think they might i think i want them to go out and say that was the best actor i've ever seen in my entire <laughs> life that's the best i've never nothing will ever top that <laughs> that would be good if they said that, to oh. that but yeah i think um yeah, I just send them out happy and uh, and 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 yeah, off to off to dip their toes into this amazing world of comedy a bit more would be great. Yeah, amazing. Well, I'm sure they will, Robert. I have no doubt. I have complete faith, and we can't <laughs> wait to see Spike uh, and your good self when you make it to Cardiff in the last week of November. Thank you very much. Yes, please come and see us. We're really looking forward to Cardiff. My mum has booked a coach load of, of, of her friends to come, so that's the most exciting thing we're looking forward to. Wednesday matinee, there's going to be 50, 50 pensioners from Porth Call. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you could have a better audience, Robert. No, 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 no. If they stay awake, that's what I'm just hoping, as long as they, as long as they <laughs> don't drop but off. But with all the audience interaction. 
Yeah, they're gonna yeah, be part yeah, of the, I'll keep shouting at them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, amazing. Thank you so much, Rob. It's been a delight to talk with you today. Oh, thank you. Thank you.